Iron or JD? This is bloody exciting. I'm excited about this. Can I just say, JD? I can, I can smell the excitement on your face. You just, you're like, I found it. I found a diamond in the rough here. The whole pit, which just sits off the sort of coast, like just a few meters off the coast, it's with a seawall in between. God, you wouldn't want to uh, blow out the wall and uh, let that sea in. I've heard that might have been done before. <laughs> you're really preying on that wall holding. Oh. G'day money miners, we are Wednesday, 19th of July, welcome to the show, JD Trav, how are we today, gentlemen, jovial? I'm doing well, mate, we're going to talk about some iron ore, you pumped. Oh, we, we did mention the old infamous iron ore to put, provide a bit of colour on the brown stuff, or red, it's red, isn't it? Red, orange? Red, yeah, I oh, know, fuck all about iron ore, so I'm looking forward to you, uh, Broadening my intelligent horizon on more commodities, JD. Mate, I'm looking forward to what you've got in store as well. <laughs> oh, mate, sorry, boys. I've gone on a random unwanted crusade again. A little history lesson with Matty. I think there's some <laughs> alpha in this episode. I reckon um, just based on, on some of the things we've seen in the market today, there could be some good insight to come, so stay tuned. Right, let's rip it then. Uh, Rio Quarterly, boys, let's start there. Yeah, let's let's keep it sort of super high level. Trav, you had a glance through this too. I read I read a few a few paragraphs. I, mate, Rio is too big for me to care about. It's too, it's too hard to understand. Bloody huge. <laughs> <laughs> what what does sort of stand out, or what I'm sort of interested in, is their sort of commentary on the copper space. And I think they flagged that Oyutogo, the the big asset in Mongolia, is sort of ramping up as expected. And there were sort of comments from. Uh, from the CEO that they're expecting to triple copper production by the end of the decade. But in the near term, they are downgrading copper. They've had reduced rates at Kennecott, which we flagged a couple of weeks ago. They're having a big upgrade at, as well as some unplanned maintenance in in their Chilean assets. So I think, I think Ayu Tolgo is one of those examples we've talked about where big companies that have got shitloads of capital can just develop these mines to become absolute rock factories in the future because uh, they can get to the bottom, develop these big caves. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a massive oh, – well, it's already bloody massive. Yeah, Huge agreed, operation. Mate. They've made a, a very big bet on this one, on on the asset, on Mongolia, on copper. So it would be interesting to see how it plays mm, out. They'll be open. The old copper price goes up a bit, I think. It sure will. Yeah. Right, boys, Peninsula Energy, the uranium. Keep these uranium bugs – Interested on Twitter. Jeez, they, there's some uranium lovers out there, eh, Ricciarda? There are. We, we put our, uh, dipped our toes into the space, I think it was last week, talking about the uh, uranium space and the players that are in there. The news today, though, is not good news about one of the companies that we, we, we did briefly talk about in that show, and that was Peninsula Energy. They're, the develop, well, they're developing the Lance Project. It's a restart project in Wyoming, USA. So the news that they came out with today is that Uranium Energy Corp, UEC, uh, they had a contract with Peninsula to treat their loaded resins and produce yellow cake from them. It was a, you know, toll treat sort of agreement there. Um, and they've terminated the contract. Uh, so I think it's just like worth keeping in mind that Peninsula was expected to be producing mid-2023, aka now. So this announcement, we learned that, you know, they, um, they now have to process this resin in-house as opposed to being able to, to toll treat this um, material in stage one. It's pretty um, pretty disappointing, right? So, I, 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 and if you think about like the investors that were invested in this stock, they, they've they invested because they think that um, production is, you know, happening imminently. They're going to get cash flow from that uh, production. They're fully funded. Um, happy days, right? And then now the plan is to actually bring forward the development of the back end of the plant themselves and do this resin processing themselves, which means that there's a significant delay to both timing of any production and also the ca further capital requirement to Mate, get there. It's a, it's a huge change if you're an investor in the story and it's little sort of surprise that the stock's down over 20%. You know, Not only are you not going to be producing in the near term, but you're going to have to spend money. Yeah. So pretty understandable how the, how the market's kind of reacted to that one, I think. Oh, mate, and you guys know how much I love talking about developers with ramp up issues, right? I love it. Just love talking about it. Um, not not, not the, sure to topic see the Trav. I know. <laughs> I know. The juicy part of the Lasson curve, hey? Exactly. So I tuned into the yeah, to the investor call that uh, management held today and I've got a few takeaways. The, f the first one is that UEC didn't actually provide any reason for 
terminating the contract. There was simply just a mutual 270 day termination right and UET exercised that. Um, and, you know, the story told by Peninsula is that they, they had, didn't, didn't see this coming. Um, some more takeaways is that in Peninsula's DFS that they put out in 2022, they talked about stage one using the 12 trading, but stage two, they'd spend some more money on the CapEx and have higher throughput, but also have uh, developed the, the back end of the plant that, w- that would be able to um, process this, um, the, the resin themselves and produce yellow cake themselves. But and now they've got to bring that forward. And, and did the did the CEO get asked about any sort of obligations? I'd imagine he would have got asked about obligations in the contract book to deliver because they do have a contract to deliver X amount of yellow cake uranium to the utilities. Did that come up? He, he was actually asked twice about you know what their their future obligations are in relation to delivering existing contracts with utilities. And uh, he's, he basically sidestepped the specifics of the question twice. Um, you, you, instead of sort of being specific about what those obligations are and uh, he, the CEO's response was really just pointed towards um, th- some wording that they have good relationships with the utilities uh, and they see, you know, potential for flexibility there. So, I, I, I you know, I, I think um, – I think – I don't know if you can you can assume that they have good relationships with everyone because they probably thought they had a good relationship with UEC as well. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, I love it. Take that, that at face value, but yeah, yeah, probably worth noting the company does slag that they have a bit over eleven million dollars US equivalent in uranium, you know, yellow cake at the moment. So they could yeah, there's, use there's inventory there to be yeah. yeah used to hopefully enable some flexibility on the on delivering into those obligations. But like yeah, the, the reality is if you're producing later and there's no guidance given towards how much later they're actually going to, you know, see production now because everything's a bit vague. Yeah. Um, you know, there's going to be some tough conversations there and I don't know if all the utilities are going to be left happy or and, and, and how many of them, um, like are there any going to be financial obligations in rela- relation to meeting them? I think that's still to play out in the market. I think, um, I think you know, there, there, there's another point and that's the, the CEO flag that when asked, so one of the one of the analysts asked if there are alternative processing opportunities regionally, and, and the CEO, it, it appeared like they hadn't done much work to explore that. But if there are, then um, that's a possibility too. Gotcha. So they've got a bit over twenty one million dollars now US on on the balance sheet, but potentially, I mean, you sort of flagged that resin aspect. CapEx could look like 24. 24 was what was flagged for the plant component of stage two, which included the resin development. I mean, yeah. I don't know how, how how real that number is. I think, yeah, the big the big issue is just, you know, the unknown timing and the, and the unknown capital requirement to get there. But Yeah, is there a capital raising on the horizon? Well, yeah, they're going to have a capital shortfall, I imagine. Yeah. Um, but the big, I think the big unanswered question we're left with is like, why did UEC terminate? Right, like, like why? Uh, I think there are two possibilities. Um, the first is that there was just a commercial issue for UEC, be that a, a, any number of parameters, but that, that'd be a valid thing. It'd be surprising that they didn't actually tell Peninsula what, why, if there is a commercial um, issue. And the other possibility in my mind is, is it actually a strategy to knock the company down and then lob a bid for them? So that's you know, an, another possibility um, because, yeah, sometimes – Things are intentional, right? Actions are intentional. So. Trav, you love this one. We actually brought it up regarding the the Gualia thing. Remember, we we discussed it. Were Silver Lake perhaps trying to plot <laughs> to delay the eventual buying of the assets to sort of push St. Barbara into a difficult position with mm. their creditors? Is a, <laughs> that was an interesting one of, Trav, one of Trav's theories, wasn't yeah, it? I, I I liked it. I thought it was. Pretty I good. thought it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. It would have been good if it played out because uh, makes us look bloody that's, good. That's, <laughs> we're, that's if we're predicting truths. That's hardball business, eh? Hey? Actions are intentional, mate. Corporate behaviour is is always thought out. Well, usually thought out. So I think there's either yeah a commercial reality that we don't know about. It would be strange that um, the peninsula don't haven't been told specifics about it, or or there's yeah some some motive there around. Consolidation. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about UEC as a company. So, yeah. Mm. Where what what sparked our initial uranium love? Was it the the demand from Twitter? Was it Terra Capital chat where uranium's made its way into money and mine? I'm loving I th- it. I think we've always wanted to. And I mean, commodity price, mate. It's high. Mm. Yeah, I mean, beyond that, the the future in nuclear is what attracts me to it. I think that's the most interesting part, and logically 
we go to the uranium miners for that. The more, the more I tell it's on my typical how quickly I get bloody conned into things. The more we talk about uranium, I'm like, oh, beauty, I'm going to put all my money into that now. <laughs> <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't take long to switch my focus. <sighs> All right, Maddie. <laughs> Company we've a couple of companies we've spoken about quite a bit. West Gold selling down their stake in Alto. So. Mm, now I've gone on a rabbit hole, an unwanted rabbit hole investigation here, boys. Um, I tend to do this. You just need to put a leash on me or something. So <laughs> I think we're gonna we're gonna start a jingle anytime you do one of these. We're gonna call it a segment, and it's gonna be called Irrelevant History with Maddie Markle. Maddie's history <laughs> sessions. <laughs> so it starts with Horizon. <laughs> Snatching up a, a three odd million dollar stake in Alto, Alto yeah, and so we're yeah. going to get the whole history of a few different players. <laughs> well, Alto, uh, there was all the word on the decline about West Gold selling down their stake in Alto, and who was picking it up, and we've got all the info today. Yeah. So, and Trav has a carton coming our way. Oh yeah, we'll get we'll get into that. Not not conclusive evidence yet but possibly so look the announcement today from horizon gold was that they purchased the 9.9 percent of alto which was given uh, which was purchased from west gold so three million bucks but uh and it says they and the interesting part was the loan facility that they used to buy these shares was from borrowed from their major shareholder zeta at an interest rate of 8% per annum, repayable by no earlier than 31st of December. So, now How Z- much does Zeta own of, of Horizon? So Zeta are a 72% shareholder and, of Horizon. And this is Horizon Gold, not Horizon to be confused gold, with not Horizon, Horizon Minerals. minerals yeah. H- also, HRN. Horizon also a gold, gold company on the ASX. Yeah, one of so them just needs to take the chance to change one of their names. <laughs> <laughs> need, a, need a gas corn situation so it'd be forced to change a name. Right, so, and look, Horizon Gold, they've got the, their main thing is the Gum Creek project. So it's in the sandstone. So this is, all, it looks like a play to possibly consolidate this sandstone region which people have been trying to do and it just hasn't really happened yet is it a play we don't know so um first we'll go into zeta because zeta's popped up a bit and you've heard them in relation to the igo uh panoramic takeover back in back a couple of years ago to end of 2020 so we'll go through who they are so look they're a they're Title is of resource focused investment holding. They're on the ASX, they trade on there, and they've got this 72% shareholding in Horizon Gold. They're also um, also in Panoramic, they're in uh, what you say, Hud Bay, uh, Hud Bay. Yeah, they've got a few sort of bauxite holdings, and yeah, a lot of them. I think they're their two metal. biggest holdings with the bauxite aluminium ones. So, so it's one of those listed funds, is that how it works? Yeah, I think it's like. As you think I said to me before, Trav, like Lowell, Lowell Resource Fund there on the ASX. So I don't know if they're classed as a listed investment company, um, but yeah, they trade on the ASX. So um, they've got two of the people from uh, Zeta are on the board of Horizon. So one of the non-execs is this Dougal Morrison, the exec non-exec chairman of Horizon is Peter Sullivan. So you'd hope they've got two when they own seventy two percent. Yeah, you'd think so. He's the, God, they might they might have more bloody for all they're the two I found. Um so he's the chairman of Zeta. He's also non exec director for Panoramic and is all, he was the long serving boss of Resolute from uh, oh, all of two thousands to about twenty twenty, I think. So he is the money. Now Zeta also own at the moment a thirteen percent shareholding in panoramic resources. So we'll tell you how all this ties in. So look, and as I said, Horizon, their main asset is this Gum Creek gold project. So it's like got a 2 million ounce resource. I think only 1.3 of it is free milling. There is refractory. And the other thing about Horizon Gold is they don't have much cash themselves, right? A couple hundred grand of cash. A couple hundred grand. So the only way they could fund these shares was via this loan from Zeta. Which is effectively borrowing it off themselves in a in a way. Which um, and there, this Gum Creek is just north of Alto's sandstone project. So, and they've got the it's where that old Gidgee, there's the Gidgee Mill, I think. That Horizon, they got two bits: this Gum Creek, and then south of that's the Gidgee deposit. And there was that there was a historical um, uh, old mill there, I think. So, look how panoramic tie into this. So. Panoramic actually bought that Gigi Gold project that Horizon now own. They bought that from Apex Minerals in 2011 for 15 million bucks. So Apex were the ones, if you remember, that owned Waluna 
before Waluna went into that version of administration. They've been into a couple, so that was Apex Minerals. Um, Zeta, and then Zeta started buying shares in Panoramic in 2013. So Panoramic were at sort of all-time lows, so Zeta started buying their shares then. Panoramic then IPO'd their subsidiary, Horizon Gold, in 2016. So they've effectively their, spun out. O- their ownership of this Gigi Gold, they've spun out as Horizon Gold in 2016. Um, Panoramic, they retained 51% ownership of um, Horizon Gold. So you had Peter Harold was the chairman of Horizon Gold. He and he was the long-serving MD of Panoramic. He's now in uh, Poseidon. Uh, Paul Bennett, our friend, he was on there as non-executive director as well. And Zeta underwrit 15% of that initial IPO. Then Peter Harold left Panoramic in August 2019 after that 18 years. That's when Victor come on board as the new CEO in 2019. Um, At that point, Zeta owned about 35% of Panoramic. And they got in a bit of a... I remember Zeta, the first time they ever popped up on my radar, was them causing a bit of a kerfuffle uh, blocking IGO. What happened there? Uh, so just after Victor come into the scene, that's when IGO put the takeover, all script takeover offer in for Panoramic. 312, 312 million bucks, all script. Um Probably probably should have taken it if you look at the uh, if you look at the share price I'll put up here. That's where the start of that blue line is where the takeover got put in, and that's where the share price yeah. is now. So, so Zeta blocked it. Right? Zeta blocked Zeta it. Zeta blocked it. Twelve, yeah, we, 12 months later, IGO do the deal of the decade and buy green bushes instead. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, well played, IGO. Because <laughs> wasn't and we, wasn't Western Thanks, areas Zeta. was Western areas. They were a shareholder in Panoramic as well before IGO. <laughs> Took them out. I'm pretty sure. No, yeah, we, no. I, uh, so, um, yeah, Western areas uh, were a shareholder in Panoramic, and that's why IGO have their current shareholder. That's why they've got the twenty. In, yeah, in Panoramic is via the acquisition of Western areas. So yeah. then, I guess. So that's after that little. That's where Zeta's involvement with Panoramic and uh, that takeover bid was. Now, if you go back to Horizon Gold in February 2020, Panoramic. So now remember Panoramic had 51% of Horizon. Panoramic sold 26.4% of its Horizon stake to Zeta, five and a half million bucks. So then the next month, uh, Panoramic sold the remaining stake, full stake in Horizon to Zeta. So that's how from that point, that's where Zeta took that majority ownership of Horizon Gold. They pretty much bought it all off Panoramic. So I know a lot of that money went towards the Savannah restart. So, But in like in 2022, I noticed that um, Zeta started uh, – sorry, yeah, Zeta started selling down their Panoramic stake, sold about 2% worth uh, last year throughout the year. So yeah, so took right, a bit of cash off the table. Right now Zeta hold 13% of Panoramic yep. and IGO 21 yeah. yeah, fascinating. And I guess it just poses the question um, about Horizon Gold's interest in Alto. Mm. It, it sort of just looks a lot to me like a a, um, a, a, a real kind of forceful bid to, to, to consolidate. They're trying to force their hand in a bit it's, of a merger with, with Alto. Yeah, and it looks like it's a lo- logical, like looking on the map, there's no other play for it really. They're, they're like, directly north of them. Um, Look, I don't know if they've got to build another mill. They've got that old one there. It's not. Don't think it's working. Not all. But. Not all regional consolidation is logical. You know, this just reminds me of the exact same playbook that Middle Island took with Alto themselves, mm. like literally uh, twenty four months ago. Yeah, and they, they, they rocked up with a stake, and it does. Like, if your deposit is uneconomic, merging with um, someone else doesn't make your deposit suddenly economic. So I don't know. <laughs> about the economics of Horizon's well, project, but Middle Islands was definitely well. I know the Horizon, the Horizon one's got the refractory um, about you know nearly a third of their a bit over a third of their resources refractory. Um, so mixing uh, and where is that? I haven't looked too much into it. Like where is that refractory? Is it on the surface? Is it deep underground? Um, 
how much of that free milling is available up front. So, look, and there's been, like for our time, we're talking about whether it's merger or takeover, there's been plenty of takeover stuff with our time. This is when you boys would have been at the desk, eh? You would have been all over this shit. I was still boring. I was and had no interest in financial <laughs> markets then. So, you can... Uh, Look how far you've come, You mate. can educate me on the way to this. Well, so, mate, it was... I would tell you, it's a funny one because it was just like the smallest company but the hottest property. Like, you know, it was like $30 million market cap and every... Like, I just had... 14 takeover offers in, mm. in two years. Not not that many, but you, you, I'm sure you'll tell the story. Well, the first one, so March 2019, you mentioned Middle Island. So Middle Island announced an all script takeover bid for Alto, valued at 9.4 million bucks. And that was a 61% premium at the time. So Middle yeah. Island, they owned that Central Sandstone project, which they sold to Oriman. Oriman have it now in Eventually. 2021. They sold that in 2021. Um, that's the one that Oriman have now. So that takeover lapsed after nine months, didn't get anywhere. So then the next year, 2020. Yeah, I think keep in mind that was an all script takeover offer. And if you look at the relative share prices between Alto and Middle Island, you'll see that Middle Island just goes down and down and down since then and, and Alto sort of maintained. So so that 61% premium you quote eroded rapidly. Because mm, I think they're just cop- – they're looking for copper now, aren't they, Middle yeah, Island? I yeah, think. I mean, yeah, if you, if you realise there's not much – merit in your ground what do you do you can mm. pivot <laughs> and i guess and this whole takeover thing so it like goes it'll link up to what this this parcel of shares i'll bring it back to this uh parcel of shares that zeta have so then the next year in 2020 uh gold sea so a Ch- they were a chinese mining company they they put a takeover offer in for alto at six and a half cents so alto i think what well, they're in the fives today i think alto rejected that offer then there, there was then media speculation that the privately owned uh, Adamant were going to make an improved offer for Alto, but mm. they didn't put an offer in. Adamant, Adamant actually owned 10% of Alto. Um, then you had this... There's even more like behind the scenes with all this stuff too, Maddie. I reckon, because Gold C, they hit a hurdle with FERB because they were a Chinese group and you weren't allowed to invest in... Yeah. Um, like China was just blocked from investing in Australia back then. And the other thing too is I, I think... I think there was like um, the takeovers panel got involved in this one because Alto issued a rights issue to try and fend off um, some some of this, and the takeovers panel didn't like that. There was there was a whole ruling about this one. Yeah, um, yeah, no, yeah. I didn't. Uh, God, I was late enough with the notes today. I didn't want to start reading into that and confuse <laughs> myself. So yeah. So after that media speculation that Adamant were going to make a bid, so then comes the takeover offer from private investment cup company Habrock, which is, as you said, Adamin, all, yeah, same, all, all same linked people. up together, same people. And so, Adamin have Kirkalocker. Yeah, yeah. And which is um, – and we'll get into that when that went into care and maintenance. So they, they then offered – Administration. Administration. Uh, administration, sorry. They then offered 6.6 6 cents, so up from – uh, so it was only just above their trading price, uh, uh, just above the um, Gold Sea offer. They uh, – then Gold Sea improved to 7.5 cents. But the big condition, as you said, was that foreign investment review board to get passed um, for that. And then, so look, Alto rejected the Habrock takeover offer in July 2020. So the Habrock then increased it to seven cents, um, but that offer expired in October 2020. That didn't go through as well. So I think the kingmaker to getting the deal done at Alto is a guy who owned 20%. Um, of the company at the time. I don't know if he still owns 20%, but yeah, I think his name's Terry Wheeler. Um, oh, the Wheeler and Dealer. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to fact check me after, after showing that one, but yeah. yeah. So there, there was all those attempts in 2020 and that's when, uh, so in 2021, that's when Habrock, when Adamant went into administration with that Kirkalocker mill. So and they're still in administration there. And there was also, you'd remember that Habrock, they were also had the legal dispute with Gascoigne. Because they were trying to – were they trying to purchase Gascoin out of administration? Yeah. In, but instead, Gascoin got to recapitalise. Yeah, I think they, they, they put in like a last-minute alternative docker to be voted on when Gascoin was in an administration. Um, and so did Han, Han King, by the way, which mm. yeah, another China gold company. Um, but, yeah, they weren't successful. Neither of those were successful. And the, the docker that got voted in was just the recap – yeah, and then oh, it's, and to tie this up with that parcel of shares that got that Zeta has just bought, so that same parcel of shares has been like a like a bloody on gifted Christmas present. So Adam and Adam and sold them to 
Middle Island. Middle Island then sold them to Westgold, and now Westgold have sold them to Zeta. So that parcel of shares, that 9.9% today, hasn't actually been on the market. It's all just been these big swapsy around. So you know there we crazy? go. I sorry, actually... sorry, sorry to go on a rabbit hole today, boys, but uh, I like this shit. There's another bit of info there, Matty. Word on the decline in relation to when Middle Island bought those shares. They breached a standstill because they obviously signed a CA back in 2019 when they tried to um, do a merger with Alto. Yeah. And they bought those shares in breach of a standstill, hence they had to offload them to West Coast. Ah, uh, there you go. Word on the decline. Geez, how soon you got two finance boys that were in the industry? Um, yeah, so I guess a bit to play out here in the Sandstone region. Will there be some uh, play from Horizon Zeta towards Alto? Yet to be determined. Well, it looks like it looks like Horizon are trying to get um, get an outcome there, but but it also just looks a bit to me like the playbook that yeah that Middle Island executed and that didn't like you know M- Middle Island clearly wanted to consolidate with Alto, but were never successful. And what happened? Their share price drifted and drifted and drifted, and they eventually sold the Sandstone project to Oriman. And then and I think Oriman are heavily um, indebted with uh, they got convertible notes and. Stuff. Is it convertibles? They got. I think there's. there's some, yeah, I know they got. Some, there was a lot of script consideration involved, but your middle. But Island. now the situation they're in now, I know they've got okay. some convertibles. Not familiar. And, yeah, in a in yeah. a tough spot, I think. So and, and Middle Island are no longer caring about the Sandstone project. They're focused on some copper thing in Northern Territory instead. Mm. Um, but like the, it's a playbook you use when you're a little bit pessimistic about the outlook of your own project, and you want to um, force an outcome of consolidation with a peer who might have something that looks a bit better and gets a bit more market um, market interest. So I don't know if that's what the play, if that's the playbook that Horizon are, um, are going for here, but it, it just feels a little similar. I reckon uh, if anyone's got an intro to uh, Peter Sullivan from Zeta, ex, ex-fame of Resolute, he'd be a great man to have on. Uh, he'd be the man to talk to about this. So look, the lines are open, Cobber. Too easy, boys. Thank you, thank you for my uh, letting me go on my uh, what would you call it filibuster history with Maddie. <laughs> I love it. Your title, irrelevant history. <laughs> I uh, like it. I love it too, mate. I yeah. love it. I do love it. There's, that's the thing about our industry is, um, like you said, nothing is ever created. It's just hot potatoes. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, but I didn't know the link between that. This was a spin out from Panoramic and Panoramic and Zeta and everything. So I am I I and the money miners are much more the wiser. I hope now. Righto, boys, next. How about we get in some more M&A speculation? Some interesting sort of corporate activity at Rex Minerals. Oh, yeah. Rav, this one caught your eye. we have I'm not sure if we've spoken about Rex on the show before, but they're a sort of copper developer with an asset um, on the on the peninsula in South Australia. Yeah, mate. I hit- think you were, talk- you were asking uh, Richard Morrow about them, weren't you? Trav, yeah, like I was asking why in comparison Caravel, to Caravel. Uh, instead of Rex because I like Rex. I don't own any, but um, I do like Rex. Like it's one of those. It's a hillside copper project in South Australia. It's been around for a long time, and because it's in South Australia, the knock on it has always been, well, why weren't why why didn't Oz Minerals you know do any do anything with it? Why didn't they have a have a crack at it? Because it was right on their doorstep, right? Um, and now that question mark's not there because Oz Minerals doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's a bit more relevant now. Uh, and it's just one of those one of those like big, lowish grade, high throughput, I think, you know, six to eight million tons per annum uh, throughput, undeveloped copper projects out there. And, and uh, they're not capped at nothing. I think it's 140 or 145 yeah. roughly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, pretty, yeah. Like it's, it, you're right. It's like not, not insignificant from a market cap perspective. Um, and... You know, I reckon one day it'll become a mine. It's just a, a, a matter of, of, of when because, you know, we're not finding too much new copper these days. But, um, you know, obviously f- financing a low-grade copper project takes a lot of capital. And um, even if you have a $140 million market cap, it's still a lot of capital <laughs> to, to get there. So Agreed. Yeah. So, th- so the announcement today. Yeah, it's, it's the sort of news that isn't news to most people. However, curiously, it, they did market it as market-sensitive when they released it on the platform. The news is that the board has resolved to grant directors and key executives 30 million oppies. So six people, um, that's three board members and three C-tier execs, they get 5 million oppies each. So the board agreed to pay themselves. <laughs> that's how it works, mate. Oh Someone's got to approve it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the oppies, they have an exercise price 70% above their current levels. Yep. 
but it's the vesting conditions that I pay attention to with these things. Just two of them, really. Exactly right. So two million of the oppies vest upon debt and equity financial close and final investment decision. Then three million oppies vest on successful commissioning of the process plan. Now, let's keep in mind that Rex has been running a partnering process for Hillside as announced to the market on the 6th of February this year. There's a couple of slides updating investors on the progress of that partnering process in the presentation that they released to market yesterday. Um, they, In the presentation, they maintain that FID is targeted for mid-CY23, um, so, and that FID is obviously one of the vesting conditions. So, um, and get mid, that condition mid, yeah, before you, before you check the box. Now. So, anyway, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's well like advanced. They also say that they receive strong interest from a range of tier one global mining companies, trading houses, and copper refiners slash smelters. Um, they say parties are working through confirmatory due diligence with the overall transaction timeline designed to accommodate internal approval requirements for counterparties, and several parties have requested time extensions to finalize bids. Rex considers this is in shareholder interest to accommodate. So all in all, I reckon the the options are an indication that the company is relatively optimistic about getting an outcome from this partnering process. Um, and the other the other thing I'll point out, the office vest, they all vest under a change of control transaction too. Yeah, that all important final dot point on the announcement. <laughs> 100%. So yeah, I reckon just watch this space. Um, Agreed, mate. Northern Star, quarterly. Mm, they've been hammered a bit today. They probably would have got a bit more hammered if the gold price didn't go up. I think they were down 6.3% early on. So, Sheesh. yeah, their results come out. So, oh, you go through the numbers. Sold 426,000 ounces. So that was up from 363,000 ounces in the previous quarter. So for the FY23, they pumped out well, 1.56 million ounces at an all-in sustaining cost of seventeen fifty nine per ounce. So they've met the bottom end of FY23 sales guidance. Um, quarterly cash bill, two, $259 million. But uh, so FY24, they're looking to go 1.6, 1.75 million ounces at an all-in sustaining cost of seventeen thirty to seventeen ninety. But as we know, a lot of CapEx over the next years are going towards this massive upgrade at the KCGM, double on yep. the mill capacity up to 27 million tonnes. So look, yeah, because their costs come back higher than they indicated in their April quarterly. So, yeah, because well, yeah. if you look at like Pogo, like it's a, I've sort of dug into Pogo a bit, what it's their cost and everything there because they they sold their, their all in sustaining cost at Pogo was 18, uh, 1854 an ounce and then they said their guidance for next year for pogo was going to all in sustaining cost of 1900 to 2015 yeah so and just like, under two grand yeah because because you look at the i guess you look at what they're pumping out there i'll just bring the table up here there look their head grade at pogo is 6.9 grams so it's the, they've got the grade and because you look at Kalgoorlie and yandel of 1.6 and 2.4 grams respectively but look there it's just their it is a bit smaller, but their mining and milling costs uh, look significantly significantly higher. So there, if you look at their underground mining cost per milled ton for Pogo is two hundred and thirteen bucks a ton, whereas the Yandel operations are fifty one dollars a ton. And then pro processing costs are one hundred and eighteen dollars a ton per milled and processing costs for Yandel's twenty four dollars a ton. So yeah. obviously a lot a lot more fiddly over there. A lot of um, yeah, it's just a lot of lot higher cost operation. And their grade as well like their recovery as well was sitting at eighty eight, I think. Eighty eight percent. So um, yeah, I said yeah. that they were doing some cost improvement studies and things like that. But um yeah, for for that grade it's definitely not hitting the hitting the straps that Pogo operation for what it for what it could be, I think. So it's interesting to look at the business as a whole. So obviously, like the, the gold price right now is floating in Aussie dollar terms around two thousand nine hundred, and then you've got Northern Star posting up guidance for the midpoint is for seventeen sixty for the next financial year. Now to get to like the the corporate all in cost, you you normally for Northern Star historically you've been adding another fifty percent of that, so it's sitting a bit above two and a half grand per ounce corporate all in cost. And then bearing in mind that huge CapEx bill that they've got coming up. So they flagged a midpoint of 
growth capital and exploration of 1.35 billion for the next financial year. So yeah, a lot a lot going on to sustain and and grow the business there. A lot of a lot of costs. And I guess one of those things is everyone going to be willing to wait on wait for five years till it's uh, achieving nameplate at KCGM when it starts really reeking in the cash after deploying all the capex. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, they've been hammered a bit today. So um, yeah, that's hmm. a, that's about it. Iron ore, lads. JD, Iron ore, JD. This is bloody exciting. I'm excited about this. Can I just say, JD, I like it. I love it when I see you just um, absolutely hammering the keyboard. <laughs> just um, I can I can smell the excitement on your face. You just you're like I found it. I found a diamond in the rough here. Hey, this one's tapping away, as Ruth says. This one is fascinating. So Mount Gibson Iron. The quarterly report came out. That's what drew my sort of eye. So we'll give a bit of a run through on everything that's going on. It's something I've got up to speed with pretty quickly. So they've got the Coolan Island iron ore mine. It's northeast of Broome, an island that just sits off the off the Kimberley. Now, people might remember, you guys might remember, the the actual mine was flooded not too long ago. We'll put some pretty wicked photos up. You can see the whole the whole pit, which just sits off the sort of coast, like just a few meters off the coast, with a seawall in between. Got fully flooded. So it's what? A that, what? Terrifying that, place to work. <laughs> <laughs> You're really preying on that wall holding. Oh, so yes. what they pretty much do is just mine the ore. It's iron ore, obviously. So there's not a whole lot of processing. They just chuck it on on the ship and send it to northern China. And the, one of the key differences with the um, the majors in the Pilbara is that they don't have that haulage component. They don't have to chuck it on a train for for how many hundreds or thousands of kilometers. So. Um, Looking at the quarterly today, they they printed eighty nine million in cash flow. That was on the back of one hundred and eighty six million dollars in iron ore sales, plus another seven million in other revenue, and they had cash costs of seventy seven million, with another nine million in repairs and eighteen million in royalties. So, for the scale of the operation, they sold one point two five million wet metric tons in the last quarter, and they realised an average price of one hundred and three US dollars per ton. So. Just for reference, we saw Rio today that we mentioned at the top of the show. They sold 79 million tons, so quite quite a bit smaller. Mm. But um, the grade is quite good. They they sell their grade is 65.5 percent iron, which is um, yeah. I mean the the standard metrics you often see quoted are 62 percent. There's also obviously a 65 percent uh, graded product that's that's marketed. And if you're looking for the sort of price that they can kind of get. Look at the plat 65% price and take off 20% as a sort of rough rule of thumb, but that incorporates the shipping freight. That's how it's sort of calculated. You'll understand that if you read through the quarterly, as well as any sort of penalties and provisions on their product. So that's the cash they cash they get. That is the realised price that they achieve, yeah. yeah. So the achieved sales that they said they're going to get per annum going forward is 4 million wet metric tonnes. So... Looking at this financial year that's just gone, they guarded for between 3.2 and 3.7 and between 70 and $75 per wet metric ton in operating costs. They didn't actually achieve either of these, but there were quite a few positives in the quarterly, which is why I think the stock is up 10%. So you think the, the market's starting to, to realise some efficiencies that you've identified, JD? Yeah, I do. So just quickly on the financial position, they've got $162 million in cash. They just paid out a $25 million credit facility this quarter. They've got roughly $150 million in inventories. So that's stockpiles that just need to be crushed and shipped. There was a bit of a delay fixing the processing plant. There was actually a flood in the mainland in the Kimberley, which meant they couldn't get the, the repairs out to site. So that inventory value is standing over $150 million once it's processed and shipped. And they have a market cap of just over $600 million, factoring in today the, the 10% jump in the share price. So getting into the improvements that I've sort of seen in the business, you got to start with the strip ratio. It's improved massively. So we'll zoom in on the YouTube on the, specifically on that strip ratio from the latest quarterly and focusing on the, yeah, the waste to ore mine. So if you look back a year ago, it was 5.6 to one. If you look at this quarter, it's 0.9 to one. And they've flagged 1.2 to one going forward. Mate, just looking at this photo, right? What a beautiful place to work. Yeah. And you can scroll down a bit lower on this one, Maddie, and you see uh, JD's – yeah, that photo there. Like, 
how would you just like just talk about this strip ratio dynamic because this is the thing that I find fascinating, right? You've, you you talk about having this massive or much higher strip ratio early on, and now you've got the benefit of a bloody one to one ratio strip ratio. Yeah, it looks it looks kind of like a a, a tabular type of ore body. I might be sort of wrong in saying that, but you can sort of assume as you mine it at higher levels, you're going to have to take a lot more of the the strip ratio off. And it just gets better and better as you go kind of deeper there. But obviously you get to the point where you perhaps have to do another another cutback to extend it to be able to get to that that deeper portion. It's perhaps slightly different to a lot of the other bulks that we see in, in the Pilbara that the other iron ore majors mine. But God, you wouldn't want to uh, blow out the wall and uh, let that see in. <laughs> I've heard that might have been done before. Uh, the photo kind of reminds me of um, Lahia up in – up in PNG, yep. very close to the to the ocean as well. So looking at the cash costs now, they've been coming down quarter and quarter. So this quarter, they had $62 per tonne. Last was $84 per tonne and before that was 89 The grade's also been improving up from the mid sort of 63s to the mid 65, which sort of results in better pricing. And they also sort of on the, on the balance sheet, they cleaned up those Midwest assets that we spoke about and they had that sort of Rights at the the port of Geraldton, they agreed that deal with Phoenix, and they divested any of the sort of surplus assets that they had and the infrastructure assets that they had. So, I think the a good way to go about this is sort of breaking down how to think about Mount Gibson. So, it's kind of it's essentially just a logistics business with no haulage really. You've got the cost of mining. Now, just quickly, you'll see always the wet metric ton and the dry metric ton for sales. They sort of flag that the uh, moisture content is typically between 2 and 3%. So therefore for like 100 uh, wet metric tonnes, that could equal something like 97 dry metric tonnes. So those cash costs of 77 US dollars for financial year 23, but $62 for the last quarter with that lower strip ratio. I think if you're going to look at the business for the next couple financial years, the company's flagged that the strip ratio is going to look like 1.2 to 1 that's much better than what they were doing last year and hence that cash cost should be much better than what it averaged over the entirety of FY23. So I think they're going to be leaning more closely toward achieving a cost of $62 like they did in the last quarter. And we always make a fuss about cash costs here on Money of Mine, but you just need to think about it a bit different in the terms, in the context of an iron ore miner because they don't have that huge processing cost. And then looking at the business, you've got those other additional costs. So they had royalties of $43 million over FY23, which is pretty chunky. And then you've got shipping, which is sort of between $11 and $14 a tonne. But obviously that's factored in, like I mentioned before, into the realised price. And that realised price was $103. So obviously those big drivers that you see are the cash costs that's tied to the stripping ratio and the realised price that they achieved. And then if you're going to do a sort of back of the envelope type of forecast, you can just use that 4 million wet metric tonnes that they have sort of said that they're going to try and achieve over the next year and going forward. It's, it's interesting, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know much about this asset at all, probably because it's on an island <laughs> and, um, mm. and no one talks about iron ore because it's not sexy. But, um, but I'm really intrigued, JD. Mate, there's, there's a couple sort of random questions and things I had floating in my head around this business. One of them we just touched on, what does the cutback kind of look like? When do they get to that point where the stripping ratio kind of has to change? Now, last year they did a, a, a big amount of waste stripping. And if you're doing that waste stripping, you know, and it's not part of the, for the year's operating costs, it gets amortized out. Over, over the sort of life of the mine. Is it, is it classed that, as a capex? Uh, is a cutback classed as a capex? Like yeah, the, the sort of the pre-stripping is the company can class it as a capital expenditure and amortise yep. it over the sort of the, the valuable life of that thing and that will in turn reduce the cash bill. Yep. Other things you've got to sort of be aware of, like we've spoken numerous times already about flooding. It's in the Kimberley, so that's always a risk. It's It's happened before. And also that this company is a – they're making good money at these prices and in these conditions, but they're still a relatively high-cost producer. Despite the majors having to chuck the things on on a rail cart and move it hundreds of kilometres, they're still doing it much cheaper than, than what these guys are doing it. Now, the last thing is what do they do with all that cash? So like we said, capped at roughly 600. They've got 
162 million in cash and 150 million in inventories. Like plus it's, Phoenix shares as well. So you net that off your EV yep. calc too. I think 15 million in Phoenix shares as part of that transaction. What's Phoenix again? Where's that tie in? Why uh, does that so, ring a yeah, bell? Mount, Mount Gibson sold their Geraldton Port uh, infrastructure assets and a couple of um, Midwest mines to Phoenix and Phoenix are an iron ore producer out of the Midwest. Is that the one you were talking about that uh, about the – the bloody shed yep. sign with yep. with Delta and tying that in. Yeah, yep. exactly. Ah, gotcha. I so if remember. you were if you were trying to whip up a rough sort of metric on how to look at these guys, you could think market cap roughly six hundred minus cash of one fifty to be generous minus inventories, assuming they're going to turn that into cash quite soon. That would get you to let's say three hundred, including the the shares, and they did eighty nine million in cash flow in the last quarter. Yeah, and that's, so, that's free cash flow or operating cash flow. That is operating. Yeah, yeah. Um, either way, but um, yeah, operating with a with a few bits. So that's kind of yeah being, being generous. But I mean, you could you could take another ten or twenty off that, and it still gets you to like operating cash flow to EV of one. Mm. So looks kind on of on an annualized basis. Yeah, 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 exactly. Looks kind of enticing. <laughs> I reckon one, one times cash flow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what, what's the sort of catalyst going forward? Do they, do they distribute some of that stock? Who kind of knows? So just going back to that strip ratio of 1.2 to 1, that is what the strip ratio is going to be for the rest of the mine life. So that looks pretty bloody good. Pretty enticing. Mm. There well, we go, lads. Right, oh, boys. Thank yeah. you very much. Big show. God, I forgot about it. I've, I've, it's one of them things you hear, Mount Gibson, I've never bloody looked into or I've never seen that picture before. Mm. Thank you for that, JD. No worries, man. We've got a few other iron ore players, smaller iron ore players, higher cost iron ore players that have jumped onto our sort of radar, haven't we? Yeah, I, we're not, never going to talk about BHP, mate, and Rio. <laughs> How boring. Oh, yeah, they'd love to come on. <laughs> <laughs> Drop a few F-bombs with BHP in the room. Yeah, yeah, if you don't come to Diggers, you get boycotted from being talked about on Money of Mine. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they going to Diggers? Oh, they never go. Does no, they, Nick or West did a um, yeah. Prezo at the last one. Oh, yeah. Does that mean we're not talking about Sandfire? Can't talk about them. No. Can't talk about them. No. All right, lads. Hooteroo. 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 The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.